German submarines can be divided into three main types of 250, 500 and 750 tons. Here is a 250 tonner. Its main recognition point is a small anti-aircraft gun just forward of the conning tower. Later 250s may have a conning tower which seems to be high and slender. This is a 500 ton U-boat. Its main feature is that the superstructure swells around the forward gun. Later types appear to be very full amidships owing to additional saddle tanks. The gun is mounted forward of the conning tower and usually close to it. This is a 750 ton U-boat. The later 750 tonners have guns forward and after the conning tower. U-boats, while operating against trade, normally carry out a surface patrol, prepared to crash dive immediately on sighting aircraft or surface vessels. This is a 750 tonner attacking a merchantman. On sighting an enemy aircraft, the U-boat immediately crash dives. Here is a submarine at full buoyancy. It is, of course, an Allied and not a German one. The conning tower and the whole of the upper deck casing are above the surface. In all the following shots of the submarine on the surface, she will be travelling at approximately 10 knots. Now we show you a section of the submarine. The heavy lines show the pressure hull. It is essential that this be pierced or severely damaged. It will be noticed that points outside the pressure hull could be blasted off, yet the U-boat might still get home. The conning tower can be considered as part of the pressure hull, but even if it were damaged and filled with water, the submarine might still possibly escape. The batteries are really one of the weak spots of the submarine as regards depth charge attack. If the containers are cracked through shock and chlorine gas escapes, the U-boat will become uninhabitable. The control room is the brain centre of the submarine. Hydroplanes, rudder and periscope are all controlled and torpedoes fired from this room. When the boat has a tendency to go down by the bow or stern, the captain may adjust the trim by flooding or blowing these tanks. Here is a planned view of the double hull U-boat. You will notice that there is a considerable non-vital area forward and aft. These drawings, which are not to scale, show sections through the large, small and medium U-boat. It will be noticed that the drawing of the 250 tonner shows a single hull submarine. It must be emphasized again that unless this inner circle is badly cracked or damaged, the U-boat will escape. From full buoyancy, the U-boat will take about 50 seconds to submerge completely, and it is therefore more usual to patrol trimmed down, that is to say with main ballast tanks already partially filled with water. From the air, there may be no perceptible difference between a partially flooded submarine and one at full buoyancy. The hull is clearly outlined by disturbed water. From this state, she can get under in from 20 to 40 seconds, and this is the most usual state to find her in if she hasn't sighted you first. In any weather in which it is possible to maintain aircraft on patrol, the U-boat is almost certain to be trimmed down. It is improbable that a U-boat would show so much hull as this when trimmed down. As soon as she sights you, she will crash dive, and these pictures taken at short range show what occurs. Though a submarine will nearly always sight an aircraft before she herself is sighted, you are quite likely to reach her before she has time to submerge, or she may in some cases decide to remain on the surface. In this picture, we're closing down on a submarine from a distance of about two miles from dead ahead. You will notice that the bridge screen is the only part above the water. A crash dive taken at a distance of three miles, like this one, in poor visibility, may appear a rather uninteresting shot to you, but actually it is one of the most valuable parts of the film, 
since it is all you are likely to see under normal weather conditions. The aircraft is at about 1,000 feet. This is a crash dive taken from a height of about 1,000 feet and a distance of about a mile in good visibility. Note particularly the oil she has left behind. and how difficult it is to spot traces of the U-boat against the sun. Once submerged, the submarine's hull will not be seen unless the water is particularly clear and the weather calm. These conditions are often found in the Mediterranean, West Indian and China seas, but very rarely in northern waters. When the U-boat wishes to use her periscope, she will come up to periscope depth and will show only a few inches of periscope for a very short time, sometimes only a matter of seconds. Speed will be as slow as possible, so as to avoid showing a feather of spray. U-boat's crews are fond of life, and you're most unlikely to see anything like this. If you do, it is much more likely to be a porpoise, which has not the same interest in the war. This is what a four-inch periscope looks like from approximately 500 feet, the submarine doing four knots with about two feet of periscope showing. When actually attacking, and sometimes when patrolling in a very calm sea, a thin periscope is used, about one and a half inches in diameter, and showing hardly any feather. There it is. This shot is taken from about 800 feet. It is when surfacing that a U-boat is most likely to be caught on the hop. She has had a good look round before coming up, but may not have seen you. We're going to show her to you from various heights and angles. Here she comes. You can see that she's going ahead fairly fast, but there is a period before the captain and lookouts can arrive on the bridge when she is least likely to see or hear an aircraft. If you're about, this is your big moment. Let us now examine the traces left by a submerging U-boat, as these are probably all that will be left for you to see by the time you get into position to attack. Here you will observe a very clearly marked temporary swirl left by a submerging gun, as distinct from the swirl from the conning tower. This represents a normal swirl left by a diving submarine. The white blob to the rear, that is, on the left, is probably caused by the propeller, but one may safely say that normally the propeller marks would not show before the leading edge of the bridge swirl. Here is a swirl taken from a low height, about 100 feet. And this swirl is from 50 feet in a calm sea. This is a patch of oil left by a submerging submarine. It is unlikely that you'd see this unless it was severely damaged. Here it is about a quarter of an hour later when the seas have rolled it out. We are now going to examine in detail the probable movements of a submarine underwater and the position in which the depth charges must be placed for a successful attack. Let's have another look at the plan view of a U-boat. In order to be lethal, a Mark 7 450-pound depth charge must detonate within 21 feet of the pressure hull. So the pressure hull has a virtual target area of this. Depth charges exploding outside this area will not be lethal but may do considerable damage to the internal and hull fittings without necessarily forcing the U-boat to surface. When the U-boat dives, she follows the track shown here. During the dive, 
air bubbles and probably oil bubbles are released and these rise slowly. By the time they reach the surface, the U-boat has advanced a considerable distance. Hence, it is useless to drop depth charges on the oil or bubbles. Depth charges sink slowly through the water and must be dropped a distance ahead of the U-boat, which will depend on the depth setting, so that the U-boat steams into the charges as they sink. Here you see three depth charges being dropped so that the center charge is a hit. That was a perfect attack. In that attack, it was assumed that the U-boat continued on a steady course. A U-boat, although she can and probably would alter course in order to avoid her attacker while in the process of diving, would prefer to remain on a straight course till about 90 feet depth is reached. Our diagram shows one particular case. At, or about 40 seconds from the time the bridge dips, the U-boat will almost certainly be swinging to port or starboard. And after 50 seconds, maybe anywhere in the shaded area. It is therefore of the utmost importance that your attack should be made in the early stages of the dive, since the charges dropped in the successful attack you saw just now would only have been successful provided the U-boat had not had time to alter course appreciably. You will now see the method of attacking U-boats as carried out by naval aircraft. Two conditions will be shown. Firstly, when an aiming mark such as a swirl of disturbed water made by the conning tower is visible, but the U-boat itself is submerged. And secondly, when some part of the U-boat itself can still be seen. In both cases, the attack should be made from a height of 50 feet and at a definite predetermined ground speed. The object of the aircraft should be to come up from a stern of the U-boat and on the same course. Here is a U-boat when first sighted. The pilot at once manoeuvres to bring his aircraft into position astern and notes the course which the U-boat is steering, while the observer keeps careful watch on the submarine to note its movements and stands by to start a stopwatch as soon as it submerges. The U-boat, having sighted the aircraft, is now submerging and the aircraft is getting into position astern. The last part of the U-boat's conning tower is just disappearing below the surface, leaving only a swirl. And it is at this instant that the observer must start his stopwatch. The aircraft should now be flying straight and level, the observer keeping a close watch to note the exact moment that the aircraft passes over the swirl. As this happens, he stops the watch and notes the time shown. This time is, of course, the period that the U-boat has been traveling underwater, and from this time can be calculated the distance the aircraft must fly on before releasing the first depth charge. This distance is already worked out for you in the conversion table for various ground speeds. Suppose the stopwatch gave the time of one minute Against the ground speed of the aircraft, which in this case we'll say is 100 knots, the conversion table shows three seconds. The aircraft must therefore fly on for three seconds after passing over the swirl before dropping the first charge. The normal charge for the swordfish aircraft is three Mark 7 depth charges and the standard spacing is 200 feet. Therefore, at our ground speed of 100 knots, the second and third charges are dropped at intervals of 1.2 seconds. The standard depth setting is 100 feet. It will be seen from the diagram that the three seconds period after passing over the swirl placed the depth charges just ahead of the U-boat, so that by the time they had sunk to detonating depth, the center charge was right on top of her. The 200-foot spacing allows for different submerged speeds on the part of the U-boat. Nevertheless, however accurately gauged the moment of the depth charge release may be, the attack will fail if the U-boat has moved laterally outside the lethal range or if the aircraft is off her course. It is therefore of paramount importance to estimate her course correctly and to get in your attack quickly. When it is evident that the stopwatch is going to give a time interval of less than 40 seconds from time of submerge to time of passing over the swirl, the corresponding time from the conversion table will be so small as to be negligible and therefore the first depth charge is released half a U-boat's length before passing over the swirl. There is an important exception to the rule that attack should be made from a stern. If the U-boat is first sighted steering towards or nearly towards you and then it submerges, too much time will be lost in getting into position astern 
and the attack must therefore be made from ahead, the charges being dropped by estimation and due allowance made for the advance of the U-boat while they are sinking to detonating depth. In this connection, the importance of being able to drop a depth charge from a height of 50 feet into a circle of radius 21 feet, that is, the lethal radius of the depth charge, cannot be overstressed. Experience has shown that this standard of accuracy can be attained with practice. Watch the target marker. Less complications are involved when some part of the U-boat can still be seen at the instant of depth charge release. As before, the aircraft should attack from a height of 50 feet and in the same fore and aft line as the U-boat. In the case of a four-charge attack, the first charge should be dropped when the angle of depression to the base of the conning tower is six degrees, or one and a half U-boat's length astern. In the three-charge attack, the angle of depression should be eight degrees, or one U-boat's length astern. Finally, remember that the secret of success in attacking a U-boat is to estimate her course accurately and to get in your attack as quickly as possible.